Hello everyone. I'm sitting here with Sabre's historian, Mr. Will Johnson, who's also my family. And we had a pleasure last year when we visited Sabre to spend some time with Will and get some history of Sabre. And those videos did so well that we asked Mr. Will Johnson if he would sit with us again this year. And specifically what he's going to share with us today is something really important for Sabre. The history of our very famous airport. A few weeks ago, we shared a video with Sabre's smallest commercial runway in the world. Today, we are sharing the history of Sabre's airport, starting with these two young co-pilots who are making a place in Sabre's airport history. Thank goodness for um, modern technology, right? That we can do this. <laughs> now, you guys are in Samarta now? Yes, yes, we are in okay. Samarta. Okay, and how did it go with Canada when you took your trip to Canada? It was good. Um, we actually went up for recurrency training. Ah. So it's, it's uh, basically the aircraft that we fly. We need to stay current on um, certain maneuvers that we do because we don't actually get to do them in the actual aircraft. So we take that time to do an instrument proficiency check, which is basically an IFR flight where we basically do a lot of IFR approaches with both engines and then we do it with a single engine just to keep um, current and proficient on those uh, exercises because you know the seats don't happen every day and you know we even though we are a small small airline we still are an airline so we are governed by certain rules and just like all the bigger airlines KLM Air France those fellas they would have to do recurrent training. We would have to do recurrent training as well. Gotcha. And because, yeah, emergencies don't happen every day, but we still right, need don't to. Want them to. <laughs> exactly. But, but we still need know. to know yeah. how to properly um, work through those uh, emergency situations. Yes. Right. Right. So what made you decide to be pilots? Did you want to be a pilot for when you were a little boy? When people ask you want what you want to be when you grew up, did you want to be pilots? For me, yes. From since I was as young as I could remember, I always wanted to become a pilot. So I chose that path. I chose to tell my life around aviation. Yeah, well, for me, it was, it was a lot different. I'm a, I'm a very science type of guy, so I really love physics. Ah. So I was doing a lot of research. And um, at that time, Jaws already started his flight training career. So I was like, you know, let me, let me look to see what maybe, you know. And that's when I realized the, how an aircraft actually works is nothing but physics. So that, that draw me towards it. And once I did my discovery, I just went up with it. That's awesome, so, so tied right in. Yeah, so I mean, he's a technical guy when it comes to like how everything in aviation works. Yeah, what does he say everything? Well, like, <laughs> everything that he knows so far in aviation work, me, I'm just a guy that loves to fly. Loves I it. love the skill. I love the skill with flying. That's awesome. What made you decide on Canada? Why Canada for your schooling? Well, it actually is more is simpler than a lot of people think. The aircraft that we fly currently was made in Canada. So that's why so, Canada. Yeah, I said to myself, you know, self. <laughs> I think it's best, you know, to go to Canada to learn from people who know about bush flying. Right. And then when I come back down, I'll be able to fly the aircraft like somebody who knew how to fly from back in the day when the aircraft was made. And I would say that I've achieved what I went for. 
So I, went to, I went to the same school Jaja did. So um, by Jaja being there, it was, it was like a, he did all the research. So when I came up, it was just, just to look at what he was doing and the atmosphere at the school. And going to Canada was, was I find, the best choice for us. Um, because yes, the exchange rate um, when it comes to converting from US to Canadian did help us, but also um, we have a higher, well, in my opinion, we have a higher uh, level of training because we do certain maneuvers that in the United States or under the FAA, um, you don't get to do those until later down in your career. And I find that it's a lot helpful for those who aren't looking to become commercial pilots but still want to become pilots that they still have these um, exercises and the knowledge to recover from a certain situation that in the United States if they studied they wouldn't have gotten that information if they didn't become commercial pilots so or just, would have gotten the information theoretically but not the practical the practical aspect because that is where it's that's where you have it the most time where you do get the information but you get it theoretically but you don't get the practical side of it because you know some of the times the school will equip with the aircraft to actually show you what this maneuver is because it it reaches beyond the limitations of the aircraft you know okay. so right now how was it easy to get um jobs at winnier did you know beforehand that when you finish you would be able to work for winnier well it was, we didn't know beforehand yeah. but we had like a sneaking suspicion that coming back to winnier would be something that would be beneficial to us just because we're locals we're from the area right so it's also moving back home, you have a greater chance of getting uh, a job, you know? Right. But even at Winnie, I, I also tell uh, my parents and jobs that we are very fortunate to be hired because most pilots out of flight school, they don't get a job immediately, right? It's because our profession requires experience, right? But in order to get experience, you need a job. But in order right. to get a job, you need experience. Yeah, it goes hand in hand. Yeah. And now, how long will it take you to become a captain? How how long? How many hours? Or how long of a process for? Well, it's uh, a thousand hours total time for us, and roughly two to three years. But it all depends on if the company needs captain sooner, then um, we can uh, we can get captain earlier. But it's normally about three years and a thousand hours. That's great. And how was it the first time you land onto this smallest commercial runway in the world? <laughs> well, for me, we had the luxury of going my first time empty. So wow. you didn't really, you know, see what weight would do to the aircraft when you landed on Sable. But you know, my first time was really cool because I got, my parents were there, my grandparents were there, you know, all the people that love, that I love was there to welcome me for the first time coming to Sable. So, for me that it was, was special. Really, yes. Yeah. It was the same with me. On the approach into to Sable's Run Day, it's, it's like everything is like in slow motion in a certain sense. Like we're moving wow. so slow and it's like, on one hand it's like, you don't want, you don't ever want to leave this this place where we are right now. Just the nice view, come to save a short run in. When you land, it's like, you're really here, you know? <laughs> you wanted to stay in that moment. Yeah, there's, there's a certain point in time, right when you about to land, where it's like everything just freezes and it's like that sweet, is a, a is a sweet feeling. A sweet spot. So although you had land as a passenger so many times, that was totally different landing behind into that seat, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you, you know, as a passenger, you're not in the front of the plane. Yeah. Right. Right. No, we're in the front front. Can't get no forward than where we are. <laughs> 
that that's wonderful well Saber is so proud of you guys I <laughs> excuse me followed your story you know with your landings and everything and I, I was so happy and I'm proud of you and I'm so happy that we have this opportunity although we didn't meet up at the airport to be able to talk to you you know through zoom so thank you so much for taking the time out and we wish you lots and lots of success on your way to becoming captains both are much success in the future and we will follow your journey (laughs) thank you both so much no, no problem. We appreciate it. We hope to see you sometimes at the airport or somewhere. Yeah, in no person. Problem. All right. All right. Take care. Okay. Have a good okay. one. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. I'm standing here at the airport with Mr. Will Johnson, and I'm fascinated by how many times he has landed and taken off from this airport. Will, would you share with us a little bit how many times and why? Well, the article that I wrote about 50 years of air service to Sabre was from some time back. So in the meantime, I might have put on more mileage, but I remember that I had made a, a, a good calculation of all the years, especially when I was a senator, how much I had to fly out and fly, and, and fly back in. And I think it was over 800 times and are you used to the landings now? Are you? Did you get used to landing on this airport? Never. I still, <laughs> I still haven't got used to it. It's always an adventure, right? Always, always. I have days of anxiety before I take the plane over. Aww. And, uh, but uh, yeah, so far we have good pilots, and uh, there's been a, you know a few close shaves. I myself was in one, or, one or two of them, and uh, but. Uh, on the whole, uh, you know, it gets a lot of publicity, and I hope that this program will give it a little more uh, exposure with the history and so. Yeah. Which I'd be glad to, to do that. Thank you. So, Will, we really appreciate you taking this time to share this history with us. Well, thank you very much. It's always my pleasure to share my memories because I, 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 I try to be as accurate as possible in my research. Now, let us go back to ancient times. <laughs> you know, the, the BBC used to have a, a program uh, when they had shortwave radio on Sunday evenings, and I used to enjoy listening to it. And one night they were interviewing a rabbi, and um, he said, uh, you know, God gives a gift to everyone, every place. He said, you have to look around and, and see what God's gift is to your, your place where you live. He said, for example, the Mediterranean. On both sides of the Mediterranean, from Algeria, Morocco, all them, on the other side, Spain, Italy, all the way over to Lebanon and so, uh, the, the main uh, source of, of, of revenue and pastimes and uh, agricultural product is the olive tree. He said the olive tree is God's gift to mankind. And I remember that to, to, to the Mediterranean countries. I remember that in relation to our airport here. When you look at the, the, the volcano that we're living on, yeah. if that uh, lava stream had to stop, let's say maybe 100, 200 feet further up, there would have been no possibility no, for the airport to sail. So that little extra flow that uh, of lava that went out into the sea, that's God's gift to Sable for Sable. the airport. You're right. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it is, yes, you go look at an old picture of Sable, you see that, you see yeah. right away. And that brings me to uh, Mr. DeHannon. Um, Mr. DeHannon really was ill served with his contribution to Sable in the sense that he had a vision he, 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 I will deal with some barks in a while, but Mr. DeHannon, his, he got his Dutch name from, apparently his mother was uh, Dutch, his, and his father, they were, apparently they weren't married, you know, he was a good personal friend of mine, especially later in life, uh, but 
I never dug into his past as far as that, yeah, but I, I knew I was told that his mother was, was a Dutch woman. Well, he ended up on St. Bart's, but he had a very colorful career all his life. He um, lived a life, especially when he was in St. Bart's. He was a good friend with Jack Cousteau, the famous. Uh, the famous. And, uh, on, the, in, on YouTube somewhere, you will find a program with him and, and Jack Cousteau up in the north of Santo Domingo. Um, diving and probably looking for treasure because he was into that as into well. That. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, and he he came to St. Bart's back in the 1930s. When he um, came there, he started his own uh, company um, and he had a, a, on Tintamar Island, or what they call uh, uh, Flat Island, on the uh, Opposite Grand Cause is a man. He had their own airport. He started the airport there, and he would fly. Uh, people would come there with a boat. He had a, a series of, of blue boats, I think he called them. And um, people during the war, um, my boss, Franz Connor, said that, that uh, they blamed him that he was using his, his boats to supply the German submarines. Oh. And um, so he said uh, any donkey or anything, any meat he could get to sell to the submarines, he sold it to them. And then they would, uh, yeah, proceed. Uh, so at war at, and on the submarine, you see, you had to also eat. Yeah. So he um, he was accused of that. And uh, they, uh, but he, he, he stayed in the bars. And then he, um, he, he, during, well, even this happened even before, no, after the war. He, he used his airline also from uh, Flat Island to carry passengers. And so some nuns uh, had crashed in one of his planes uh, from St. Bart, very popular nuns, and, and died. Uh, he did find the body of, of one of the most famous nuns at the time. Oh, and uh, he had a, 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 a more than one accident there, and so then he stopped with, the, with that um, thing there. But now, he used to also bring mail, but not very often, with his, his plane. And I remember as a boy, and, uh, everybody running outside, there was a plane, and he dropped off the bags of mail, and wherever he landed, <laughs> They would go and pick them up. Oh, wow. And, uh, but uh, the, the, the main thing and, uh, that he, uh, where he started out with Sabre from is this, uh, this is a colorized photo of him coming here. The original photo that was taken by Governor Mark Sweet. Uh, the, the governor at the time, Mr. Mark Sweet, he loved... Uh, the photography and he was governor here for several years uh, his wife was uh, a La Vega, Cynthia La Vega you could keep those and then he um, uh, coincidentally the governor was down in the harbor because uh, the cargo boat from Curacao was in and he had gone down on his horse and he saw this plane coming and the, the plane landed right there off the Fort Bay and uh, I had never seen this until yeah, right I saw the you. So uh, I got more than one. Uh, this is the best out of the series of photographs. I have one with her taken off and so on. So um, Mr. Wheat uh, must have gone aboard, you know, with the, with the boat because he was the governor and everything was right. going on there. And uh, after that, he, he became very interested in getting an airport going on Sable. Now this here shows you uh, when he landed, when he was, he came to Sabre, and uh, he, uh, this, this, I, I got separate pictures of that, and that's him up there in front, uh, yeah. in the cockpit, and this is the area where the airport is now on St. Bart's. Bart's. Yeah, and he holds, the Hannon had several meetings with them, and 
he told him, listen, I've been flying around the island. This is the only spot that I see where an airport can be built. And uh, some people were saying, uh, you almost have this division between uh, Wilmer Side and the bottom about where things should go. The, uh, compromise that we made, he put a hospital in St. John's, which was not the best location. Yeah. When I was commissioned, I moved it, back to, moved it to the bottom. And uh, nobody didn't want to put it in Windward Side. The other commissioner wanted it the bottom. The same thing with the airport. But um, he said, it's either there or it's not going to be airport in wind conditions under the tent. He said, you'll never be able to land the plane there. So he, he made an agreement with them that they wanted to, um, uh, if, if they had volunteers to do the airport, that uh, to clean off the, the place down there, right. to contact the owners. So one of the owners was my grandfather, my father's father, um, who had died in the meeting. My father was in charge of the property for the rest of the family. I have the bill of sale and uh, the, the property, uh, there's the only bill of sale on Sabre where it states that the property runs from sea to sea. So there were, where you land at the airport is down uh, over the, the the sea and then right. it went all the way down to the Cove Bay. Well, uh, and uh, yeah. we were able also with that same bill of sale to win the case for the property owners because the government had claimed the land said, oh, those people were just possessing unclaimed land and so whereas for ages uh, the Hellsgate people had been farming down there they had uh, uh, receipts to show for their uh, the, the property and so so this the Eugenius Johnson played a very big role too Eugenius was always a guy get things organized from the Lions Club right back Eugenius was your man for yeah. anything like that and he could mobilize the Hellsgate people and the idea that they would get the airport, uh, well, everybody chipped in, but especially the Hellsgate people, they built a road. They, you know, they wanted a road to end for Hellsgate. Right. And uh, they helped with everything. We, um, the, I was in the boys' town in Kurosawa at the time, so I was not here when all this took place. But we, um, I can show you from this photo here, that's, that's my father there with a with a hat on, uh, and uh, then you have different cool. people in here that I can recognize. That looks like Floyd Every and and so on. And um, lots of volunteers came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And less than no time, they had cleared it off. Wow. Uh, I don't know how many weeks, but uh, I have different photos where show you the progress from start to finish. So back in 1959, when the airport was being cleared off for the first plane to land, there was no road all the way to the airport. The road ended in Hell's Gate. So when people were tired after a day's work of clearing off the property, they had to walk back up all the way to Hell's Gate because there was only a goat track from the church in Hell's Gate to the airport. So it was a long way back up for them to get a vehicle onto the main road. Sabre was built one wheelbarrow at a time. Wow. The roads. Everything I see, was... I see one wheelbarrow uh, yeah, here. Yeah, only so one. <laughs> those things should be, well, they wouldn't be able to find that one back. No, should have kept no. that put to the museum. That so, worked hard. <laughs> anyhow, I have loads of photos that, I just made a small selection of it. Loads of photos that um, were taken of the landing. I recently got this one. This is Hyacinth. Uh, Johnson, born Hassel, who married to my uncle Leonard Johnson. Yeah, right. You probably remember Hassel. Yeah, yeah. And uh, her daughter, Cheryl, also, uh, who lives in um, Philadelphia, I think it is. And she found this and she sent it to me. Oh, and, nice. But I have other ones showing you where he came in, he landed. And all. But that's at the end where, the, where he landed and so. And. Uh, the whole island, I guess, turned out for the for that occasion. You can see people all, all over. All over. How exciting there. that was! But I wasn't. It was the 9th of February, 1959, when he landed. As I said before, I was in the boys' town on Curacao. Harold Livingston, 
Michael Livingston's son was there with me. All and right. a bunch of Sabre boys. So Harold got this telegram. Um, plane landed, okay, pilot safe, and, and that was it. So we were, in those days, you didn't have There was no Facebook to check. <laughs> you wait until one of your parents, so the next, I usually get a, a letter from my mother, but then uh, that time I got three letters, one from Eric, one from Freddie, telling me everything about this play. The whole week we were at a loss as to what uh, Commissioner Matthew Lewis had meant with the telegram. Yeah. And uh, indeed, uh, it was him. Now here is when he landed, after he landed, he had a lot of pictures taken. Oh, yeah. I have a whole collection of them, which I have shared with all sorts of newspapers and magazines and so on. But here he is there. Uh, I, I even have the original uh, piece that was given with the flowers. With the flowers? Him oh, on his wow. landing. This was Commissioner Machu Livingston here. Uh -huh. Commissioner Arthur Hansline. Oh, and, I thought he looked familiar. And, and that is Mr. Dahana. And that's his his mechanic. But I, I never did get to know what I can ask his son because my son lives in Argentina and I have him on Facebook with me. What was the name of the mechanic? I keep promising to do that, but uh, yeah. he played an important role anyhow. But no, let's finish with the building of the airport. So, Tarwati, I must give him his honor too because he was desperate for. To, he had popular guys running against him, and he was desperate to get something going for Sable. And uh, he, I have pictures with the boat brain and the uh, the, the equipment to build the airport. Jacques Delevier was a contractor, very famous contractor from France, who lived on the French side, and he um, he had built several buildings here, the two schools, uh, the hospital at St. John's, and so on. And uh, so he got a contract, and Chester Wathi was also one of his partners. And uh, he brought in the equipment, he got things going. And uh, it, 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 you know, it wasn't until, and I always remember your brother Vernon, or uh, that, because it was open on Vernon's birthday, uh, the 18th of September, 1963. Yeah. Was the opening of the airport. Of the airport. So, I remember to, mommy saying about the yeah, yeah, to get, yeah, to get those dates yeah. in my head, I associate that with persons. So, yeah, it's a bit of a Vorna was born, uh, he was uh, born 1955, right. but that was his birthday, and uh, so they had a big ceremony. And now, let me bring in um, uh, Irowskin. Uh, Irowskin was uh, Minister of Finance at the time. He came here, he and Lampa, and Lampa's wife was Vatapu's daughter. Lampa only had one child, um, uh, a daughter. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, she might be still alive on Aruba. And they nearly got lost on Machu Livingston's boat, okay. going to St. Martin, bad weather and so. And in Rouskin, um he said, well, if, if, he, if he survived this, he would definitely look for money to get the airport, because this thing had been lying there from 1959, and it was only 400,000 gillers and the Antilles had money, so it could have been done. But anyhow, he um, he got the money, and so they give him the honor to name the airport after him. But um, Irowskin, by the way, I've brought it to the attention of, of the government, I will mention it again in this program. It's not a why, there are, Erosians on a river that have a wife, but this Mr. Erosian that got the, uh, the money was an I. It's, oh. I know sometimes it's complicated to change things after it's been. So but I think the government could do that, give them, because the rural yeah. government contacted me once, asked me how come they spelling the name with a Y? And I said, well, is it that a way it's spelled? He said, no, his, his is an I. So he even sent me a copy of the birth certificate, but uh, that is that's not the most important thing. But I think if we go name things, you yeah, put a correct name. name. I was going out running for office at the same time. Very tricky situation. Uh, yeah. But anyhow, I was able to manage it. But I decided, well, while I'm there, I'm going to at least honor Mr. DeHannon mm -hmm. by giving uh, him the name uh, of the airport. 
And this gentleman here is the, in the middle. He was the Dutch representative on St. Martin. Uh, and this is Mr. Hahn watching at the plaque. So we, we, we give a plaque and everything. He was quite honored. Yeah. His family came here and uh, we, um, we had a nice ceremony. Chester Wati and, um, and a grey old lady owned Winwood Alloways. Um, when the airport, before the airport was finished, they were looking for uh, an agency. So we were down at a reception at the bottom by the guest house, where, which is now the, the government, the Dutch government um, uh, facility. Right. And Ronnie and a group of them said, oh, you're an idiot. You've been here campaigning for Claude Wati. And uh, at least ask him to give you the agency for the for the uh, airline. So I said, well, I didn't do it for that. And um, I said, Claudia, too happy with me for supporting value. So anyhow, um, I did uh, at a time, I, Chester did ask me to look for somebody responsible to run the utilities. So I suggested oh, right. uh, Walter Slicer, Slicer, and he couldn't have found a better, no. better person. No. And uh, so then uh, I wrote a letter to him, uh, but I, I consulted first with Freddie, because my, my poor father could hardly read and write, but, and then he was suffering bad with his heart. Uh, oh. And uh, I suggested that he, if he could give the, the, the agency to my father and, and the boys, would find a way to, to make the they could work. And uh, they, so he appointed, a few days later, the letter came in appointing Daniel Thomas Johnson as the agent. But then Freddie, um, you know, he, all his life, Freddie uh, yeah. took care of the agency. And people ha people see things and then he figured there's money. And I remember once Freddie went to Holland and I, I was on Sabre then. And, um, I took care of the, the agency for him for a while. Walter Campbell lived next door. And Walter said, but you are working for nothing. Uh, he said, you, you can, you authorize to write out tickets and sell tickets. I said, well, I'm a little scared about it. Freddie said not to do that. Uh, he said, I'm going to the States and uh, you can write out my tickets. So he showed me how to do. And Kenneth Peterson, his wife, are going to Holland. So, well, the commission that I got was um, 1,500 guilders or something for the month. My mother said, no, there's got to be some mistake here because uh, it, it's never been more than 200 guilders a month. Whoa. And we, uh, Freddie never got, um, he should have gotten a, 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 a fee that they pay the airline agent for the handling of the car, uh, of the plane and so on. Right. Freddie never got that. It was a guy, uh, Smith, who knew Ted, uh, Freddie from Sabre, but he uh, uh, was with the manager for a while. He lived in Aruba. And he said, but well, Freddie, all these years, we've been paying the agents on some barts and, uh, and, and station about a 30 gilda landing thing to help with your cars with the plane. Freddie used to get Thomas and them to help out our load of plane. So there was no real money in it. Right. Um, and, uh, but, uh, I think yeah. it was more his passion for it. That he, yes, yes, and, he, and Freddie liked that, and then liked they all liked all that. Well, and the people loved him, everybody yeah, saw yeah. Freddie as the face of the airport. Imagine Leo Hassel was the chief of the fire department, and he was the one he cleaned the windows, he <laughs> cleaned, <laughs> swept the floors, everything. And then he would also help Freddie uh, with a, with a, with a ticket. Move. Now, Leo, he didn't tell me my will that you're making a mistake there, but uh, he'd have his red pen someday. He'd make a little change. <laughs> but, but during that period, I had wonderful experiences. Just married to Lynn, strange I had the land. Your uncle um, Lorenzo and them were fixing up. Uh, well, you know the house, and that's your house. It was your house. was fixing the house that Walter Campbell bought. And uh, the Everett's wife, Gosta, was going to Aruba now. Everett was a man up four o'clock, go up on his farm and everything. So five o'clock, we heard a door knocking down and Lynn wonder what's going on. And uh, I heard Lorenzo say, 
my dear sleeps late, you know, you don't get up till six o'clock and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so just married. <laughs> so when we, uh, when I went to the old Ever Red, we well, said, well, I thought oh, you were dead in there. He said, I come to play, pay for Gustav's passage to Aruba. I said, well, Ever Red, she ain't traveling until three months. He said, no, I gotta be paid. He said, he might, he might take away the flight from him. Six o'clock so, in the morning. Those type of situations yeah. you had. And, <laughs> Freddie had to deal with that all his life, and uh, he he was uh, he was a teacher. Freddie was yeah. thirty odd years. He was a teacher, well known teacher, and everything. Uh, so he did all this at home at night, kept the bookkeeper at home, and in the afternoons, Leo would handle the plane in the morning. Uh, well, there was some sometimes only one flight, three flights a week, yeah. and so on in the beginning. And uh, Freddie, um, yeah, he stayed there all his life and and did that and now uh, yeah over the coming back to the original thing what i said about the rabbi saying about god's gift since that airport um, was put into action um uh, i've never made a tally but i'm well sure there's long over a million people that have landed here yeah. and taken off from here from that airport and um, it, it it really is a great thing for see but it still has is limitations uh, because um, when the light to the runway, they gotta be extra careful. Yeah. This past week, when Teddy brought his staff, some of his staff from Aruba, to visit the islands, uh, the, the first day they couldn't land here, so uh, because of the contrary winds. Right. Now, when I was same time, I was commissioner in '99. I used to deal with the, um, no, I was acting governor there used to deal with a, a foundation in Holland called the ABC Foundation. They would send me uh, an export. I'd have to designate a project and they would send an export that could, could uh, you know, make the plan and everything. The only thing I had, had to pay was the hotel uh, and so on and make sure that they, they got as much information as possible. So. I always thought that the runway could have been a little longer in the takeoff direction. And I remember when Steve Hassel, he was commissioner then, during that same period, we had to go to the United Nations. And uh, when we left the, the airport in, in Kennedy Airport, he said, well, look, yeah, airport extension, all those big pillars going up to all those highways, and that is what I had told the guy, I said, listen, that when you go to the end of the runway, down by the sea, you can't go on the sea because down there is very, very deep. deep. But you can go down in the, in the rocks. Right. Because that is one solid, solid. mass of lava. Yeah. And they drill into the, the holes and then build those massive, uh, uh, not pipes, uh, right. uh, pillars from the sea up and then uh, extend it. then you extend the airport. And the guy did a very nice plan from a descendant guy who was down in Dominica somewhere, but export from Holland. And uh, he calculated that we could get an extra, uh, was it 200 uh, feet? Uh, it was around 200 feet. Oh, wow, uh, that's with that huge. idea. And it would cost eight million euros at a time when we were part of the Antilles. It would seem an impossibility, but oh. it um, it should still be pursued because, yeah. for safety reasons, that extra 200 feet would because uh, yeah. when you get the let's say you put a first the columns out and down at the end where the sea breaks right. up to the height, you could even build uh, you know uh, uh, something out towers the, the deck so the deck would it would not go to the end of the pillar when you go further. So I yeah. feel that should be investigated because it still forms a problem for safety reasons, yeah. you know. Yeah. The other thing too, at that time I had a plan made to have a little pier, a little harbor down in Cove Bay where you could have uh, an emergency boat that in case of the plane had an accident you could you could rescue some of the passengers in a, in a quick way. Those things can be done. The Dutch got plenty right. plenty money, <laughs> and, and I'm not saying it for any reason. But Seba has a lot of money out there on the bank. 
Yeah. It, uh, the last studies that we did indicate that there's oil out there, not exactly on the Sabre Bank, but beyond out there. And um, everybody about this oil business, but all of the Caribbean, the drilling, the mm. rest of the world still, still drilling oil. So the Dutch keep that in the bank and uh, uh, in their sovereign, sovereign fund. And I don't feel guilty of them spending any money on, <laughs> money on Sabre, so. Hey, yeah, and the airport, that, that would be a great plan, I mean, for the airport. I totally yeah. agree. And what is really good is that Freddie's children carried on the agency, you know, and to this day that they're still running. Yeah, the uh, other thing, too, that the, we always had a problem with collecting the the parts of tax. The, the government had to make some revenue and uh, security guards didn't want to handle it because each one differently said sometimes money had had gone missing and one mess so I proposed to the executive council listen let the agent of India uh, collect the tax give them a, a percentage for their work they did anyhow which that was done so they can make a little income out of that right. and then like I said, Smith uh, uh, made it possible. He, some family to Roy Smith now. He made it possible that Freddie would get something. I don't know what it is now. I think it was 30 guilders in the beginning for each landing. So then he could hire people. He didn't have to depend right. on, on on the government personnel to right. help uh, unload the plane and so on. And, uh, but mostly Freddie and Leo do, would do that himself. Yeah. Only thing that the two of them didn't do was fly the plane. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, they did everything. They did everything you know? themselves, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, well, that is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all this history with us because these things are important, especially for the new generation to keep it keep the history alive so and you are such a wealth of information so thank you <laughs> thanks again thank you and so uh, much this this is awesome and we love to share your history we appreciate you your time much. and the airport like you said it was god's gift to save us so it's, Definitely. Yeah, it's uh, really important the history of sable thank you yeah.